for their ability to sense their environment. Uh, one of them that you may not think about is the vascular tissue, and another is the epidermis. And my lab is interested in the events that occur within those tissues that allow a plant to sense and respond to their environment in a systemic way. So I start my story by telling you about a gene that my lab cloned uh, several years ago called MSH1. It is a nuclear gene and it makes a protein that is localized within organelles, mitochondria and plastids. And the gene is controlled in its expression uh, and, and the role of its expression is important to a plant's environmental sensing abilities. So it will accumulate in the epidermis. It will also accumulate in vascular tissue of the plant. It will accumulate in the meristem and in the reproductive tissues of plants. And all plants seem to show this spatial and temporal regulation of MSH1. MSH1 is a gene or is a protein that uh, is a DNA binding protein. And within the mitochondria and especially in the plastids, that DNA binding capability is very important for how they will respond to environmental change. So if we uh, identify the DNA binding domain as this FYE, uh, three amino acids, if we mutate one of those amino acids or mutate all three of those amino acids, you will see the full mutant phenotype. Because mitochondria and plastids share MSH1, we can use hemicomplementation, which means that we can um, uh, complement MSH1 just for mitochondrial or just for plastid expression and in that way we can determine that it is the plastid form of MSH1 that is crucial to its environmental sensing and reprogramming ability. Here on the right hand side you're looking at a plant uh, a tray of plants that have been complemented for the mitochondrial version of MSH1 by using a mitochondrial presequence fused to MSH1 and then put back into an MSH1 mutant. And what you see is the mutant uh, is showing variegation. It's showing differences in plant growth rate. It's showing flowering time. And it also will show differences in stress response. Those environmental sensing events are associated with plastid, not mitochondrial function. And this is how we demonstrate that. So this is the MSH1 effect that we study in order to learn how plants use uh, epigenetics to allow them to adapt rapidly to their environment. So if we start in a Arabidopsis with a wild type line, we can use RNAi suppression or stable mutations of MSH1 to create an MSH1 minus uh, mutant. Um, and that population is heterogeneous. Uh, within an MSH1 mutant population, you'll see changes in growth rate, you see changes in flowering time, you see changes in um, ultimate, uh, 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 the transition to maturity, uh, the time of maturity, uh, also changes in environmental sensing for stress response, abiotic and biotic stress, uh, and changes in growth and development. So all of those are non uh, are, are uh, uh, distributed in a um, non uh, in a uh, in a discontinuous manner, so that only some of the plants will show stress responses and only some will show early flowering and so on, mostly late flowering. We can uh, use an RNAi transgene 
so that in the next generation, we can segregate away that transgene after we have created the MSH1 minus phenotype. And we can create stress memory, which means that plants do not go back to normal. About 20% of the plants will retain uh, changes associated with the MSH1 phenotype. And those changes involve delayed uh, flowering, uh, delayed maturity, altered photosynthetic rate, and changes in stress response. But these non-genetic memory plants will be heritable indefinitely and will show complete penetrance. That means all of their progeny will show the effect and that progeny will give rise to 100% progeny that again show that effect. If we take a, a memory plant or a mutant, MSH1 mutant plant, and we cross it or we graft it to wild type, the progeny from that cross or that graft will give rise to enhanced vigor and enhanced uh, environmental resilience. When I talk about grafting, I mean the MSH1 mutant is the rootstock and wild type is the scion, is the top of the graft. And then we produce seed and we look in the next generation. So we're only looking for heritable epigenetic effects that are caused by the suppression of MSH1. Okay, so we know some things about this MSH1 effect. And one is, I'm able to advance my slides. Uh, one is, that um, this effect that we see of the phenotypic variation, the stress response, the stress memory, the crossing and graft outcomes can be recapitulated, can also be observed in any crop that we've investigated. And we also know that the MSH1 effect is dependent on the RNA-directed DNA methylation pathway, which is the most common epigenetic pathway that is, is functional in plants. We know this because um, the transition from wild type to MSH1 mutant requires the presence of histone deacetylase 6, which is a chromatin remodeling protein that is associated with stress response. It's associated with circadian clock response, and it's associated with uh, stress uh, developmental responses to stress. If HDA6 is not present, then the MSH1 mutant is lethal. We also know that the transition from the MSH1 to stress memory requires a DRM2, which is the main methyl transferase associated with uh, the RDDM pathway. We also know that in grafting, when we use MSH1 as the rootstock, we, we can combine MSH1 with DCL2 and 3 and 4 as a quadruple mutant, and that will eliminate the ability to create that enhanced vigor and resilience growth. So we know that that grafting is involved, is dependent on transmission of small RNAs across that graft junction. So the dependence on small RNAs, the dependence on histone behavior, and the dependence on methylation um, all indicate that this is an RDDM dependent phenomenon all the way through, which means it's added uh, indication that this is epigenetic reprogramming that we are conditioning by the downregulation of a single nuclear gene. Now, this gene does not work alone. There are other genes that work in association to create epigenetic reprogramming, and they also reside within the plastid. One of them is PPD3, which is a putative MSH1 interactor, also found in multiple plants, although we have studied it in most detail in Arabidopsis. So PPD3 is a PSBP domain-containing protein. So let me remind you that in the plastid uh, that is involved in photosynthesis, it has photosystem 2 as a complex within the thylakoid membrane. And at the base of photosystem two is the oxygen evolving complex, which is responsible for splitting water, creating electrons that are involved in electron transport. 
one member of that is PSBP. And our gene, PPD3, is a PSBP domain containing protein, which means that PSBP has founded a family of proteins that are related and have the same PSBP domain within them. All of those proteins, uh, there are a family of at least uh, nine proteins. There's PSB, PS, uh, PPD1 through seven, plus PPL1, PPL2. Uh, those PSBP related proteins all appear to be involved in redox uh, responses within the plastid, which makes sense because redox is involved in uh, interactions with uh, plastoquinone for electron transport, as well as reactive oxygen production as a consequence of altered redox. When we uh, create mutants of PPD3, we can do it two ways. One is we can overexpress PPD3, and the second is we can underexpress by RNAi suppression. In both cases, we can create memory. And the way we do that is we start with, a, for instance, an overexpression line, and then we segregate away the transgene, and then we see small plants and large size rapidly growing plants in the same population. If we select a dwarf and take its progeny, it will again show dwarfing and rapid growth in the same population. Likewise, choosing a large plant will also give us heterogeneity in the plant populations. And you can see that on the left panel where you see null number three and null number five. Those are memory populations with very small plants and very large. And if you look at them at flowering, you will see that in null five, they have plants that are larger, more rapid growing than, uh, than wild type and more rapid flowering as well as those that are smaller and will be delayed relative to wild type. So these are non-genetic or epigenetic effects that occur, create memory, and that memory is heritable. So these are phenotypic variants that are created by the downregulation or perturbation of one single nuclear gene. We can create memory with MSH1. We can also create memory with PPD3. So how are these related? If we looked at them uh, and as they localize within the plastid, what you would see for MSH1 GFP is that it makes one large punctate dot within a plastid. If you look at the same plastid for PPD3, you would see that PPD3 provides a haziness as well as these punctate dots. If you put them together by merging these images, you see that the Punctate dots are immediately associated next to MSH1, but not overlapping. And if we look at them with autofluorescence, you can see that these plastids are much smaller. In the, here, you're looking at the epidermis, and down one layer, you can see the mesophyll, the photosynthetic chloroplast of the mesophyll, which is much larger than these epidermal plastids that have MSH1 and PPD3 within them. In the electron micrograph below on the left, you can see that when we look at MSH1 within a plastid, it's located in the nucleoid, which is where DNA is contained and where RNA is expressed. And MSH1 as a DNA pro binding protein is within the nucleoid. But you can also see that it can cluster in the nucleoid, giving us this large uh, signal, GFP signal that we see in the upper panel. But if you look at the right at a plastid that contains PPD3, you can see that it's located out in the thylakoid membrane, and it's also located in a cluster within the nucleoid. And therefore, you can see that for MSH, uh, for PPD3, you get a punctate dot that is smaller next to MSH1, also in the nucleoid, but you also see haziness because PPD3 is also in the thylakoid membrane. These plastids where we see MSH1 and PPD3 are specialized plastids. They are one third the size of the mesophyll chloroplast. And we believe that their primary responsibility is environmental sensing and signaling. And therefore they are in the epidermis, in the vascular parenchyma, in the uh, uh, meristem and in reproductive tissues. 
And in each case, they are much smaller than a chloroplast, and you will see that PPD3 and MSH1 are in the nucleoid associated with the DNA. If we suggest that this is environmental sensing, then plants should change their response to the environment once we have changed the expression of these genes. In the upper left-hand corner, you're looking at the effects of drought on MSH1 memory versus Columbia Zero wild type and some of the PPD3 variants as well. And what we know in this drought experiment, these plants were first planted in saturated soil and then went 32 days with no watering. But below that, you can see the effects at 56 days and 64 days of no watering. And what you see in each case is that PPD3 and MSH1 altered plants will perform better against drought than Columbia Zero, even though all of these plants are isogenic. Remember that with memory, we add a transgene, but we take it back out. So we don't change the genetics of any of these plants, and yet all of them perform differently relative to drought. In the lower right-hand corner, you see a response to salt. And here what we do is we plant these plants and we start them, we germinate them, and then we irrigate them with zero millimolar uh, salt or 100 millimolar salt. And what I want to show, show you on the left is you're seeing wild type in the far left, which is in gray, and the range of seed production. When you think about salt, it isn't so important that the plant can grow or be photosynthetic. It's important that it can grow its full life cycle to producing viable seed. So we assay for salt tolerance based on viable seed production. You can see the seed weight range for wild type. And then if you go to the 100 millimolar salt, you see that wild type now is producing almost no seed from any of its plants. They, they simply, they can grow, but they cannot produce viable seed. But you will also notice on the right that some of the PPD3 and MSH1 modified lines will produce plants. Each dot represents a plant that is producing seed of equal weight to what wild type produces within the range that wild type produces uh, in, in uh, normal conditions. And that range is produced here with this dot, dotted line. So you can see that many of these plants produce a good amount of viable seed under conditions of, of, of high salt. So we see not only drought and salt tolerance, we also see high light tolerance, we see cold tolerance. Um, these plants are showing enhanced stress response to a number of different environmental changes. And this is our model, because I don't have much time with you today. I just want to sort of summarize this so that you understand what we think we're looking at. So we think we're looking at a specialized plastid that we call a sensory plastid in specialized parts of the plant. Within that plastid is a nucleoid where the, the genome is located and where it expresses. And within the plastid genome, you will find MSH1 and PPD3. You will also find PPD3 out in the thylakoid membrane. And if we apply stress, what we find is that MSH1 and PPD3 transcript levels go down. So you reduce expression of these two genes under conditions of stress. And for MSH1, that creates conditions of genome instability. And you will now see illegitimate recombination, ectopic recombination occurring within the plastid genome. This is associated with changes in redox, this number four here, because under conditions of MSH1 suppression, we see changes in plastoquinone uh, reduction levels and levels of plastoquinone in the plastid. There's higher levels of plastoquinone and it is more reduced than you would find in wild type. So we know redox changes are accompanying this as well. We also know that uh, the plastids under stress will produce stromules. These are long arms, extensions of, this, of the plastid. Often they will touch the nucleus and often the sensory plastids will come up next to and associated with the nucleus under conditions of stress. We also know that MSH1 and PPD3 seem to localize at the points where these stromules originate and that if we, incre if we, uh, uh, if we uh, knock out or suppress MSH1, then PPD3 concentration in these stromules 
will be higher. What we also know is that as a consequence, there is epigenetic reprogramming of the nucleus. In memory for MSH1, the plants will become dwarf, delayed in maturation, delayed in flowering, and highly, highly stress tolerant. If we cross or graph them, we will now see enhanced growth vigor. With PPD3 perturbation, we will see both dwarfed and enhanced growth in the same population without the need for crossing and grafting. So the outcome is different, but the pathways probably are very similar for MSH1 and PPD3 epigenetic associated changes. I don't have time to tell you about memory today, but I'll tell you a little bit about grafting because it's important uh, to, to understand how this occurs. We can take an MSH1 uh, mutant and we can graft to it a wild type scion and collect its seed. And what you will see is the progeny from that down below will show uh, enhanced growth relative to wild type grafted to wild type. And on the right, you can see that we see increases in total leaf area, we see decreases in the days to bolting, and we see increases in overall seed weight, approximately 20 to 25% increases in seed yield as a consequence of this grafting with MSH1 rootstock. If we ask what happens to those progeny from a graft, we can do that by using a DNA methylation analysis. Methylome analysis by bisulfite sequencing tells you every single methylation change for every single cytosine. And using that analysis and a specialized platform we've developed, you can now see that those gene pathways that appear to be most associated with the MSH1 graft effects are response to auxin, auxin stimulus, and uh, auxin activated signaling. You will also see at the base here that you also see cyclopentanone, which is a jasminate, and jasmonic acid biosynthetic process are also influenced. And brassonosteroid is a phytohormone that works associated with auxin as well. Those show a very high um, a probability of, of, um, of enrichment, as well as a large number of differentially methylated genes that you see at the bottom of that graph. If we do this same effect with grafting in tomato MSH1 and Arabid Arabidopsis MSH1, and we compare the DNA methylation changes in both tomato and Arabidopsis, again, you find a significant response to auxin as well as auxin stimulus response, and you see jasminate also prominent. So even though they're very different species from different families, you see that the same types of response to environment are occurring uh, associated with the MSH1 uh, grafting outcomes. We can also use a very interesting experiment where we can take the graft for MSH1 rootstock, but now add to that rootstock, not just an MSH1 mutation, but also a DCL2 and 3 and 4. So we have a quadruple mutation. DCL or dicer like 2, 3, and 4 are responsible for small RNA production. So when we do that graft, now the rootstock is no longer able to produce small RNAs, even though MSH1 mutation is present. And we can make a comparison between those outcomes using that DCL234 MSH1. Uh, quadruple mutant. And what I want to point out is, again, the differences between those that are associated with the epigenetic RDDM pathway and small RNAs, again, are response to auxin, response to auxin stimulus, and cyclopentanone as being uh, the most enriched uh, in terms of probability, um, which you also find, or in terms of their p-value, you also find uh, things that are associated with phytohormone signaling and response also related to auxin and the, uh, the phytohormones that interact with auxin pathways. So three different ways we were able to say that when we use this grafting to create this enhanced growth that is epigenetic, we know that it's dependent on small RNAs, and we also know that it seems to interact to give rise to a programmed response that is programmed in Arabidopsis, programmed in tomato and other species, and seems to involve uh, auxin response for that growth enhancement. If we want to know some of the genes that are involved in this epigenetic effect, we can use our methylome analysis. 
we can identify genes that have are likely to be RDDM targets, and we can do that as differentially methylated genes that are associated with transposable elements nearby. And we can identify 840, uh, using uh, uh, principal component analysis and linear discriminant analysis combined, we can identify 844 likely RDDM targets for epigenetic change that will discriminate uh, the outcomes of the MSH1 graft from the outcomes of the MSH1 graft when DCL234 is used in the rootstock as well. So here it's not working, here it is working. Again, we can take the rootstock itself, here is MSH1, and here is the MSH1 with DCL234 quadruple mutant. And again, these 844 genes associated with TEs targets appear to provide sufficient discriminatory power to allow us to see the differences between those that are showing growth enhancement here in this, in this graph and those that are no longer showing the enhancement due to the loss of small RNAs and the RDDM pathway. If we take those 844 genes and look at what they belong to, what you find is the p-value is most re uh, remarkable for response to auxin, but you will also find it associated with many hormone signaling pathways. And those are the two main events that seem to be associated with the difference between a successful graft and a non-successful graft is the changes in signaling and the changes in response to auxin. As you know, auxin is very important for root growth. And so a lot of the vigor may be coming from the root. So what we do is we compare the outcomes of grafts in the, uh, for root growth. And what you see is in this MSH1 graft, you have a very robust root growth compared to when we add the two C DCL234 triple mutant. And so what that tells us is that auxin, in fact, and enhanced root growth is associated with this vigor. We see the same thing in tomato. And here you see tomato has this, this change in uh, uh, behavior of roots when we use the MSH1 graph that you don't see in a wild type graph. And these are just showing that it's also associated with auxin, um, auxin behavior. Uh, here we can look at the differentially methylated genes for auxin response. You're seeing them for biosynthesis and transport and signaling. Uh, many of them changed. You can see the list of the genes in Arabidopsis, those in tomato that we can identify. But what I wanted to show you here is that if you take individual genes and look at the changes in methylation, it can be quite subtle. So what we've done is to color code these for the type of methylation we're looking at. Red is for CG methylation and blue is for CHG. And what I wanna show you is this is an example of one auxin response gene that is responsive to MSH1. Here are the changes that occur when MSH1 is not present. And here is the loss of those changes when DCL2, 3, and 4 are present. Same in the graft relative to the graft with DCL2, 3, and 4. The same you would see for our second gene. DCL2, 3, 4 seems to change this. If we do the same in tomato, looking at methylation patterns, what you see is that you see very robust changes when MSH1 is present. But if you use a wild type uh, graft, you no longer see those significant methylation changes in the progeny uh, for that gene. So the MSH1 effect is a very powerful one for allowing us to understand the RDDM pathway mediated changes that give rise to epigenetic reprogramming and give rise to enhanced and changes in growth resilience that might be uh, valuable to us. We use this system to study epigenetic behavior in plants. We also use it to study plastid influence on plant adaptation and signaling. We also look at methylome analysis methods that we can perfect using this system. But of course, most importantly is the agricultural value. So we have implemented the system agriculturally. This is just an example of a commercial parent that is used in tomato. And over on the left is the F1 hybrid that goes out in the field using that, that commercial parent. But in the middle is a tray going out into the field where one of those parents was an MSH1 modified through grafting and the other parent was the commercial parent. So what you can see is there is significant change in growth response even before it goes to the field. 
When we take them to the field, you can see in gray wild type graphs and in green are the MSH1 graphs. Again, you can see uh, we're looking at generation four here, which tells us that this effect remains even through multiple generations after the graft. Here you're looking at generation five and generation three. Again, in each case, you are outperforming the, the wild type in gray in all of these experiments in all of these locations. We can do the same in canola, also a major crop for oil production. You get the same type of variegation phenotype like Arabidopsis. We can do graphs in canola. We can do crossing in granola, sorry, in canola. And we can put them out in the field. This is our first field test, which we carried out in Chile. You can see some of it is done under nets so that we can produce seed, but a lot of it is open pollinated. And these are our preliminary data, the first generation of preliminary data, where you see the dashed line is the, the mean for wild type, and where you see all those with stars are promising lines, some of them 20 to 28% increased in yield as a consequence of epigenetic grafting in canola. We have our second generation, our next test going out now in North Dakota. Uh, they're in the field where we'll be testing them against drought um, to see whether in fact we can enhance drought tolerance for canola. Drought is a major problem for canola production in Australia. It's a major problem in the US and it's becoming a major problem in Canada and in Europe. And so with that, I will uh, tell you the people that participate with us on this study. Uh, we have uh, Rosemary Schwegel, who does uh, much of our graph testing and phenotyping. Uh, Haun, who is the student who did all the PPD3 work. Isaac Dopp is a graduate student who did the HDA6 and some of the microscopy work. Uh, uh, Xiaodong Yang is a senior scientist with us who does the methylome analysis and studies memory. I couldn't present his work today. Uh, Harde Kundaria is a postdoc in the lab who does all of the grafting studies and the epi line, the crossing studies. Roberci Sanchez is a computational biologist for the methyl IT uh, platform. And Michael Fromm is a scientist, uh, is the CEO for EpiCrop, which is a small startup company that collaborates with us and helps us do our field uh, analysis for the work that I've presented. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to present this work. And I hope I have a chance to talk with you about this um, after my talk. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sally McKenzie. It's impressive the, the result that you have about memory because uh, I had no idea about how deep this research was nowadays. And congratulations, congratulations, because we, we think about how many other aspects may be influenced by this kind of change in, in the structure, not structure, but epigenetic um, changes in the genome. And we already don't know why it happens and probably new new finds will be, will get in the next future. So congratulations.